Namaste. So the Adhikaranas and Sutras that we've been studying lately in the Brahma Sutras have led me to a very interesting realization having to do with symbols, superimposition, the role of the teacher, the performance of teaching. Um, I'm going to have to do a little bit of thinking out loud here. Please bear with me. But I promise this is really good stuff. <laughs> so stick with me, okay? First of all, superimposition is relative to consciousness. Who would have thunk it? See, I've been dealing with the apparent uh, dichotomies of which is the substrate and which is the superimposition. Uh, for example, the uh, meditation on the sun as Brahman. All right, the, the Sanskrit is aditya drushti. Drishti, of course, means seeing. So seeing the sun as Brahman really means superimposing the sun on Brahman, right? But is described in Shankaracharya's purports the other way around, that Brahman is superimposed on the sun. So in thinking of superimposition in terms of context and content, obviously Brahman is the context and the sun is contained within it. But then further contemplation led to the observation that this depends on your state of consciousness. Yeah, for someone who knows Brahman, Brahman is always the context <laughs> in the state of Turiya. But for one who doesn't know, the sun would appear to be the context and Brahman located within it. This is because one in material consciousness is seeing the objects like the sun and prana and so on, all the other objects of meditation. And they're still in a state of agentship, thinking, I am the doer. I am meditating on this. See? So in that state of consciousness, the material object, the sun, appears to be the point, you know, the actual object, the more important thing because it's something we know. Now, what makes the metaphor work is the fact that the sun and Brahman share an important attribute. They're both effulgent. They're both uh, self-effulgent. They don't reflect any of the other light. Huh? Except, of course, if we know Brahman, we know that the sun is just reflecting Brahman, right? <laughs> But let's say we don't know. And the scriptures are written from the point of view or with the assumption that we don't know. So from the point of view of one who doesn't know Brahman, the sun appears to be the main thing because it's familiar. And Brahman appears to be the secondary thing because it's unknown. Very interesting. Green tea with lemon. Mm. Also interesting. <laughs> so what happens is, as one's meditation deepens and one becomes closer to realizing Brahma, this starts to shift. And he starts to see the material object as secondary then Brahman is the primary, as the context. 
let's break it down in terms of the famous rope and snake. Huh? The rope and the snake actually have nothing to do with each other. The snake is not caused by the rope. It is not something that is within the rope. It is not a quality of the rope. Uh, it is not an aspect of the rope. But it is simply a projection, a fictitious superimposition of the mind by association with past memories. Oh, that kind of stringy, curly thing, man, that could be a snake. <clears throat> so actually, the snake and the rope have no relation. Shankaracharya brings this up several times. Similarly, Brahman and the sun actually have no relation. And the idea that Brahman creates the sun or that Brahman's light is reflected by the sun, all these are superimpositions of our minds because we are conditioned by material consciousness. Hmm? So then I got to see that actually it just depends on how you look at it. If you know that the rope is a rope, snake is meaningless. If you don't know, the snake appears to be real. And even though the snake factually is superimposed on the rope, from someone who doesn't know, it appears to be the other way around. The snake is the real thing. The snake is the primary thing. And the rope just comes into it incidentally when your friend walks up with a flashlight and says, hey man, it's not a snake. So uh, the state of consciousness is what determines who is superimposed on what. Okay? So in the same way, the scriptures use these symbols. Well, of course, all words are symbols. But additionally, they use in the process of meditation symbols like the sun and prana and the sacred fire and mantras and so many other things as symbols superimposed on Brahman that to the neophyte or to the aspirant who does not know Brahman directly, the objects are what appears to be real. And Brahman is unknown, even though actually Brahman is the reality, etc., etc. Right? So this depends on the state of consciousness, on the state of realization, on the state of knowledge how things are seen. And today I was reading an essay, fascinating essay, on Japanese no drama. And they were saying, if, if you're not familiar with it, go look it up. I'm not going to explain the whole thing. No means accomplishment. Accomplishment of what? The divine presence. And we all know of or have experienced, if we're lucky, or heard of performances that reached a state of transcendence where this inexplicable something came into being, like this deep rapport between the performer and the audience. And in no drama, this is called the flower. Like the golden flower? Huh? Like the secret of the golden flower? Like our series on the golden flower? Because the golden flower technique is also a way of inducing this divine presence. And so is Advaita and the meditations based on it. So their analysis is very striking because they say 
that within the no actor, there is a certain tension. And when that tension is maintained selflessly and unconsciously, or that means without an act of will by the player, it is like a mysterious force that affects the audience and brings them into the play. And they actually experience the play as if they're one of the characters in it. This is the divine presence. This is the transcendence with a capital T. This is what we're also after in these informal sessions of, you know, rapping about our realizations and stuff. We want to help the listeners or the viewers come into the uh, actual state of being, the actual state of consciousness in which these realizations occur. And how do we do that? Well, there's a certain tension between the actor and the role. The actor is a real person. The role is a symbol. That's why in no drama they wear masks. Huh? to symbolize this, that the role played by the actor is merely a symbol. It's not real. Yet, it has the ability, if everything is just right, to reach transcendence. And the same is true of listening to these teachings, which is, you know, in some ways very dry, Huh? But we're trying to transcend that dryness. That's why we use music in the beginning and try to make it interesting, you know, to bring you into the mood of it. But then something has to happen. There has to be this tension within the speaker between the knowledge which is being shared, which is a symbol because it's language, and the state of being that knowledge describes, which is, of course, the state of being of the teacher or the, the speaker, if he's authentic. If he's not authentic, that's, that's a different story. <laughs> but if he is an authentic, realized being, there is a certain tension. Now, the no essayists also say that if the audience becomes aware of this tension, that destroys the, uh, the illusion. That destroys any possibility of the flower existing. Why? Because then they see it as an act. Huh? When I was in ISKCON, we had a drama troupe called the Vicunta Players, and we had a drama coach in New York, and he was a method actor. Me, uh, teacher of method acting. And he used to say, you have to get so grounded in the role that you forget your acting. And he had a word for this kind of self-conscious, effortful acting. He called it acting, huh? spoken in a certain way. I am acting. <laughs> it's obviously forced. It's obviously an act of will. And that makes it inauthentic. That makes it a lie. And the audience sees through it right away. So if you come out on the stage with your ego on, and you're like, oh, I'm such a great actor, and you try to make a big effort to portray this part, it's not going to work. What works is when you inhabit the part effortlessly and completely, without any separate ego awareness off to the side going, hey, I'm doing a great job, huh? Because <laughs> obviously that's bogus. And the audience feels it. The same thing in music. I think every musician has had, I mean, hopefully one or two experiences where this happened, this melding of the audience and the performer's consciousness happens spontaneously. 
And then you always wonder afterwards, how did that happen? And how can I do it again? And the answer is, the performance has to become completely unself-conscious, without any ego, where the music is not, you're not playing the music and thinking, wow, man, this is cool. Huh? You're, you are the music. You become the music, selflessly. The audience feels that. Like, for example, the Cone concert. Huh? The Cone concert is one of the classic jazz albums of all time. Uh, also one of the best-selling, certainly the best-selling solo piano album of all time. And, you know, it was almost a disaster. Everything went wrong. But somehow or other, the musician, whose name escapes me at the moment, got into it. And even though the piano was broken and like out of tune and everything was wrong, he found a way to play that piano so that it made magic, so that it made art, beauty. Huh? And so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a performance, a recitation of scripture, yeah, which is no different than a play with a script, only the script happens to be written down in a book, and then trying to explain it not by logic, but by being the state of consciousness described in the scripture, and just naturally explaining it in the way of like, well, this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm living, this is the way I see things, this is how I feel. And so I hope this brightens up and clears up this sometimes confusing relationship between the substrate and the superimposition and who is superimposed on who. <laughs> As usual, it depends on how you look at it. It depends on your state of consciousness. It depends on your state of being. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.